Hi and welcome to this uh, lecture between week two and week three of the DSLs of Maths course. Um, I have some slides I've prepared that I will talk on and about and then we will continue with some derivatives and application of function limits. Okay, so um, I'm Patrick Jansson in the, in the functional programming group at Chalmers and um, this is then part of the course um, where we try to encourage students to approach mathematical domains from a functional programming perspective. Uh, we try to make functions and types explicit uh, and talk about distinction between syntax and semantics, often uh, abstract syntax and then mathematical semantics. We use types as carriers of semantic information. And we try to organize our types and functions in small domain specific languages. Now, that means this the start of this lecture is uh, we also look at making variable binding and scoping explicit. And lecture notes and other stuff is avail available on GitHub, including a full book on the topic. Okay, now to one of these examples. So much of the course revolves around quotes from math books, where we try to make sense of the definitions, analyze what does it say mathematically, logically, what are the types, semantics, and so on. So here is a quote from Adams and Essex, Calculus, a complete course. And um, it defines the limit of a function. So it says that f of x approaches a limit, L, as x approaches a. And it's, this is written in this um, special, special notation where there is an x arrow a underneath the limb and then f of x, and then an equality sign, which is a bit of a, um, well, a misuse of the equality sign, and it says L. Why I say it's a misuse is because it there is not always a limit. So it's not that the limit uh, construction here is a function that creates the limit from the function, and it's A. Uh, it's a partial function. It's a relation including the limit. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at what the text is actually of the definition. So, lim f of x is L if the following conditions are satisfied. And here we got the typical calculus uh, epsilon delta statement. So it says, for every number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a number delta greater than zero possibly depending on epsilon, such that, and then a range requirement on x minus a. And um, if all of these things are satisfied, then x belongs to the domain of f. And the distance between f of x and l is smaller than epsilon. So we used absolute value here for the distance. Uh, in a, uh, more dimensions, that it, it could do more interesting things. Here, as we got just real numbers, it's just uh, the absolute value. So let's uh, try to step by step make this into a first order logic uh, statement. So if we move one step by removing all the text, or at least almost all the text, then we see the notation at the top, and then the core. Um, when it says for all epsilon greater than zero, I translated it using the for all quantifier. And there exists a delta, that's the exists quantifier. And then such that if, I haven't translated yet, but we have the final requirement and the right hand side, sort of the, the claim we're making. So I've introduced notations here, notation here for the domain of f and saying that x should be in the domain, so we shouldn't take values outside of it. And otherwise, it just uh, copied what we had on the previous slide. So if we compare here, most of these uh, little snippets are actually available 
on the next page. It's just most of the text which has been removed. Okay, let's try to make this a first order logic definition. So we take one more step and remove even more text. So this is the first attempt. And a few things to note. Um, I've defined on the left hand side a three argument predicate lim. So I say lim AFL is a predicate. So notice that I have not used the quality sign. Um, we had on the previous slide still the notation with the uh, the mathematical sort of misuse of the equality sign. Here I've said, let's um, try to be a little more formal and say that lim is actually a three place predicate and uh, A, F and L are related if, and then a certain statement holds. And I've used a name P. So we have on the right hand side here, the first part of the logic, for all epsilon there exists a delta, and then a property P that should relate this epsilon and this data delta. And then I taken the rest and just uh, made it the right hand side of P and epsilon and delta. So now we can start to do things like type uh, inference and so on, but even before that we could also do some scope checking do we really have all the variables in scope? So, for example, if I take some notes here, um, we've got an X here down here, and it's also used here, and it's used in a third place there, but it doesn't seem to be introduced anywhere. Um, and you might say, well, are the other introduced? Well, actually, yes, they are. Uh, we've got lots of things introduced. We have epsilon being introduced in the for all. We introduce delta in the exists. We have bound A, F, and L already on the left-hand side, which means that out of all the uh, things we have used, all variables we've used in the expression here, only x is the suspicious part. So if we go back a few slides and wonder how did this happen? So if we look at the text of the claim here, we had for every epsilon, for every number epsilon, for e there exists a delta and so on, and then came an if statement. I'll move back to that briefly. So this if statement is really a bit tricky. Um, so it says if, and then a property, a relation, uh, zero is less than this. And then that actually introduces implicitly a variable x. So it, this is a bit, um, well, sneaky, I would say. They explicitly introduce epsilon and delta, but x is not obvious if you're unused to reading a mathematical text or this formula, which of the symbols here, I mean, there is x, there is a, there is delta, and then suddenly one of them, x, is actually newly introduced. And it also begs to the question, is it for all quantified? Is it existentially quantified? Or is it some other x that has come from some other scope? I mean, we actually have x up here in this expression, but that's also a little bit of a red herring. Uh, the x there is bound locally uh, in the below the limb, so that's not the x. So we'll have to introduce this x here. So if we move back uh, to the formula, we have to do something to bind the x. And what I will do is to say, well, actually, there is sort of an if statement um, with this implication we've got. Um, this implication. So 
and we need an exit scope so it limits which exits are allowed by this quant so that means that we should have a for all quantifier it should be all x which satisfy this condition should also satisfy what is on the right hand side of the arrow so if we move to a possible fix of this notice i've now just did a minimal change the p predicate now has a new definition where I use for all x. And then I've introduced a new name q for the rest. And q still has epsilon and delta as arguments, but it also has this newly bound x. And then finally, we have a scope correct expression. We have all the symbols defined. OK, so this is the definition of a limit of a function. Um, getting a feeling for it, we'll see later what we can use it for, but at this stage, it's just um, um, a definition. So what's the main lesson learned here? Well, we should be careful with scope and binding of this x. It's not obvious a priori uh, which actual words in the math text definition introduce new variables and which words don't. So in this case, there was sort of an if statement which implicitly introduced the x as a for all quantifier with a uh, restriction, the main restriction. Okay, that was the end of part one.